Events Schedule, Event Schedule Page. Janine Schmold is a political scientist at the University of Erfurt in Thuringia in Germany and in her PhD she works on the uh, process of legalizing uh, hacking or and when she she had dealt with hacking back and uh, she now talk about legal aspects of hacking in the war thank you for the introduction and thank you for your interest in my topic everyone that is listening i am going to try in the next 30 minutes to talk about the primary status according to international law of those non-state actors involved in the ukrainian war because in the ukrainian war various hack hackers actors groups and collectives have got involved which of course requires a classification in terms of international law on the day of the russian invasion into ukraine the hacker collective anonymous declared the cyber war to the russian president and shortly after the ukrainian government also called for um, called in various hacker forums and via social media for people to get involved in the armed conflict and become part of a so-called it army and Mikhail Fedorov, the Ukrainian Minister for Digital Transformation, appealed on Twitter using these quotes uh, to the people in uh, all around the world to defend his country in cyberspace. And uh, there is a chat that was linked to in the Telegram messenger service, um, which you can reach via this link, where the Ukrainian government uh, that the Ukrainian government created for those hacking volunteers. And next to detailed instructions, there are lists there containing targets, and uh, these are provided. And many people, volunteers, followed this call around the world, and uh, they are conducting cyber attacks on Russian targets, many acting in solidarity, one hacker was quoted as saying, I'm doing this to punish the Russians for their crimes, for their war crimes. Another said, I just want to help us to win and stop the death and destruction as good as I, as much as I can. And there are about 300,000 subscrip sub subscribers to this Telegram group and around 400,000 volunteers globally support Ukraine digitally. Not just on the Ukrainian side, though. There have been volunteers uh, and hacker groups that have got involved on the Russian side. Uh, for example, the Conti hacker group has already announced retaliation measures if Russian critical infrastructure would be attacked. It's not always clear to what extent the many people that uh, said that, are, that they would participate um, to what extent they know that their actions under certain conditions have certain hurdles to overcome in terms of international law, and they are subject to international law, and that their actions have consequences in international law. And I'm going to try to just give you a few thoughts. Uh, all this is, of course, not regarded as final. We are in an armed conflict, and the information could always change. But due to the large number of volunteers and the large number of cyber attacks, of course, the classification of all these volunteers according to the categories of humanitarian international law is important. And the use and bellow, the law of war, uh, distinguishes between international armed and non-armed conflict and as soon as there is an armed conflict all parties have to respect humanitarian international law regardless of whether this is a war of aggression or a war of defense and uh, with the russian invasion into ukraine we have a war of aggression and therefore an international armed conflict between states which means that one fundamental condition in international law the, the um, which is codified in Article 48 of the Amendment Protocol to the Geneva Convention, 
relating to the protection of victims of international conflict, which distinguishes between armed uh, uh, civilian population and armed parties. Uh, this applies and the, the distinction between civilian population and civilian object on the other hand and the uh, military objectives uh, is important, which means that everyone involved in an armed conflict or the actors, hackers, whoever, have to regard themselves either as civilians or combatants, or they are going to be classified as that. And with these two categories, uh, there are certain rights and obligations. For example, combatants are those that are immediately involved in um, uh, the hostilities, which is legitimate. They can become legitimate targets of actions of war. They could always legitimately be killed. And if they should be uh, taken prisoner, they receive prisoner of war status. Civilians uh, enjoy general protection against all dangers arising from military operations, and they shall not be the object of attack. And I would like to first uh, deal with the combatant category, and after that, I will introduce the status of the civilians. And that is the first question we have to ask, who is actually given the combatant status in international law? The combatant status, according to Article 4A of the Third Geneva Convention and Article 43 and 44 of the First Protocol, the First Amendment Protocol, uh, is available to the following three categories of people. First, members of armed forces. Second, militias, uh, other volunteer corps and resistance movements, and um, those uh, of a mass national conscription, the mass levy. And I'm now in the next minutes, I'm going to explain all these categories. So let's begin with the first category, members of armed forces. Who can become, who is supposed, regarded as a member of the armed forces? Again, there is an article in uh, the first protocol, Article 43, uh, which says that the armed forces of a party to a conflict consist of all organized armed forces, groups and units, which are under a command responsible to that party for the conduct of its subordinates. And such armed forces shall be subject to an internal disciplinary system, which inter alia shall enforce compliance with the rules of international law applicable in armed conflict. Which means the question is whether the people involved in the Ukrainian conflict, which are non-state hackers, actually apply or fall under this category. Uh, according to current knowledge, I have to stress this, uh, it seems that at least these uh, coordinated via telegram, those volunteers uh, would not be integrated in the Ukrainian armed forces. It was the Ukrainian Minister for Digital Transformation who issued the call to get involved and become part of this group. But it seems that the many of the people involved are not primarily state actors and acting in solidarity, which does not mean that these non that that state sponsored actors or regular IT soldiers uh, could conduct cyber attacks or be part of these groups. And if you uh, look at the argument that was brought forward by I don't know who every essential critical infrastructure uh, is also they will have the involvement of secret services, so you could assume that uh, secret services are part of this telegram group as well, uh, because, uh, and of course, this group isn't completely encrypted and it's openly accessible. So that would change the situation, but I will limit myself to the non-state actors, hackers that voluntarily act in, out of solidarity, and that is the aspect I'm going to follow. I'm not going to talk about the secret services anymore, but I would like to, what did want to say that this would also be an applicable situation. I will now say that the IT Army coordinated via Telegram, of course, receives targets and instructions from the Ukrainian government. So in that sense, it could be argued that this Telegram group 
is a paramilitary organ or should be regarded as a paramilitary organ which supports the Ukrainian forces in cyber war because from the point of view of international law, it is perm permitted to have par paramilitary units and uh, assign them or give them combatant status as long as this uh, is this is announced to the parties in the conflict, in this case, the Russian Federation. And this article does say, Article 43 of Protocol 1 does say that these units have to be armed and organized, and they have to be under a responsible leadership and under an internal disciplinary system. And all these criteria they do not seem to apply to these volunteer hackers in the Telegram group, because everyone, of course, can get involved even the so-called script kiddies, people with little or no IT experience. And to receive combatant status or uphold this combatant status, they would have to be trained and prepared, which they are not, or most of them are not. So it seems that there doesn't seem to be an internal disciplinary system either. Um, so the adherence to the rules of humanitarian, humanitarian international law would be secured by that. And the fact that there isn't such a disciplinary system, which uh, from the point of international law is very relevant, uh, this fact leads to uh, the risk of an escalation. If, for example, an unexperienced hacker should attack critical infrastructure in Russia or civilian objects in Russia by mistake and cause damage, or if black hat hackers um, uh, use uh, attack uh, traffic systems or nuclear power stations. And it could happen because the Ukrainian government did call for this in various forums if, to get involved in the conflict. Hackers uh, were asked to get involved. It could happen that they neither adhere to the distinctions in international law nor to the hacker ethics. And uh, because of this problem of attribution as well, uh, it is impossible to clearly identify an attacker in time, which is why Russia could uh, uh, assign the um, responsibility for these actions to third uh, third states, or use this to uh, get involved in more aggression against Ukraine. If we look to another IT army, though, uh, which about 1,000 hackers and IT specialists have already joined, and that is um, a co-founder of the Ukrainian IT and Ukrainian IT company uh, under instructions from the Ukrainian government, also called to get involved with using the words that Ukrainian, these Ukrainian cyber community, it's now time to take part in the cyber defense of our country. Now, for this IT army, hackers were explicitly sought that had experience that were asked to apply via Google Docs. And after a selection process, uh, these units were then divided into defensive and offensive units and the defensive units are, were supposed to defend the Ukrainian critical infrastructure and the offensive units were supposed to uh, conduct offensive operations or help the Ukrainian military with digital espionage. So um, according to these quotes, these units are working close to the Ukrainian government and they do seem to be uh, part of the inner core of the Ukrainian IT army. So you can be assumed that these IT expert army, as I will call them, is part of the Ukrainian armed forces and would receive combatant status of the first category in uh, the uh, international law. So this combatant status is also applied to people that are not parts of the uh, state uh, combat force. So uh, depending on Article 4A, Paragraph 2 of the Geneva Convention, uh, 
arts uh, members of militias and uh, volunteer corps or organized resistance movements uh, can also be categorized as combatants um, if they meet four criteria. Uh, first, they uh, need to be under command uh, of a person responsible for their subordinates. Uh, they have to carry a uh, recognizable sign uh, that is visible from a distance. They may uh, carry arms openly and they uh, are conducting their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. And this means that all of these uh, and all of these have to be applicable uh, for this to be qualified. So let's start with the first criteria. Uh, they have to be uh, to be commanded by a person responsible for their subordinates, and so um, this, uh, of course, uh, assumes a certain organizational structure and uh, is supposed to prevent that individual people can uh, be categorized as combatants. But uh, now there are many non-state associated hackers that are participating out of their own uh, individual. Um, uh, conviction and many of uh, many uh, lies uh, have said that these people cannot be cat categorized as combatants and uh, can't be uh, prosecuted as such. And now the criteria of being um, led responsibly also says that the combatants uh, need to be under a command and um, are conducting uh, persistent operations. And this does not have to have the, the niveau of uh, usual military organizations, but uh, the law of sub-organizations has said that um, these uh, individual people are not sufficient for that. And now this IT army um, since this IT army doesn't have a fixed command structure and many are not capable or not willing to conduct uh, persistent military operations, the first criteria does not, uh, criterium does not seem to be fulfilled and uh, da, all of these are to be assumed commutative. Uh, the, according to this uh, article, they can't be given combatant status. So. Now let's go to the last um, con uh, combatant uh, category, and this uh, uh, levé en masse, uh, maybe that could be given. So the, the concept of the levé en masse uh, is uh, originated from the French Revolution, when the war, um, to use Karl von Clausewitz's words, uh, originally was a matter of the people, and uh, the entire a population without any military um, military training or uh, organization uh, took to their weapons. And uh, so for these levé en masse, the, uh, the, the, the necessaries for organized uh, war, uh, for example, being under a responsible uh, commander, and they also don't have to uh, wear uniforms or discernible signs to be uh, combatants. But in this case, uh, the combatant status uh, can uh, be applied to them, uh, to the, the population of a um, territory under war, if um, that it's uh, a people that uh, are taking to the weapons uh, for themselves. Um, if uh, they are carrying their weapons openly and are st uh, adhering to the laws, uh, to the laws of war, and uh, this category also has uh, four things, four attributes that need to be fulfilled. Uh, first of them, uh, it's uh, unoccupied territory. Uh, the second one is no time for organization. The third one is spontaneity. And the last one is um, adhering to the laws, or, uh, to the laws of war. And it says that a uh, weaponized conflict, like in, in an élevé en masse, uh, is only a, uh, only really uh, permissible in uh, a territory that is um, not under a uh, government. And as the Russian military forces uh, f uh, at first mostly uh, started to occupy the areas of Luhansk and Donetsk, um, 
they um, are um, there are uh, lots of people uh, in the rest of uh, the Ukraine that are currently not occupied and uh, therefore uh, they can participate in this and uh, are, are not considered a living amongst. So, and for um, the organization of a militia or a um, volunteer corp, this um, is ap applicable to the largest part of the Ukrainian population. Now, one could argue that uh, the Ukraine, since the annexation, uh, annexation of the Crimea, um, is already in somewhat of an occupation by the Russian Federation. So you could assume that the population of eastern Ukraine um, could have assumed uh, this military operation by Russia. But the largest part of the Ukrainian land was mostly surprised by the Russian invasion. And uh, that uh, can also be shown from the diary of um, uh, an, a Ukrainian journalist. Uh, another criterion for the Levian mass is also that it has to be uh, created spontaneously and they have to um, only take to the weapons when uh, the enemy approaches. So any um, non-governmental hacker organizations that have decided to stand by the Ukraine um, are fulfilling this criterion. But uh, that poses the question, what does this look like with this Telegram group? Because the Ukrainian Minister for Digital Transformation has uh, called for it, and it was uh, organized by the Ukrainian um, government, and um, goals and commands are posed there for targets to be attacked. So. It does appear as if this uh, spontaneity uh, criterion is not fulfilled, but um, a comment to the third Geneva Convention from 1960 um, clarifies that in, in, in a case like this, uh, if it is encouraged uh, by a government that this does not uh, oppose the, uh, the creation of a Levian mass. But, um, the exact wording of Article 4, Paragraph 6 of the Geneva Convention um, also refers to the uh, Hague uh, Land Convention, refers to unoccupied territory. And now it appears that the concept of the population is not just the population of the, the citizens or the, the or based on the nationality of the people, because um, that would have been explicitly mentioned in those laws. The Geneva Convention, especially the third one that is also mentioned, uh, uh, and uh, this status is mentioned in other parts of the law. So even non-Ukrainian um, inhabitants of the Ukraine uh, can be part of the Alivian mass against the, the, the Russian troops in the Ukraine. But this also means that all other hackers and all other participants from other countries, from maybe Netherlands or Denmark or Germany, are by uh, international law not permitted to be a part of this Alivian mass. And the, the weaponized and spontaneous uh, resistance can also only be directed against the Russian troops to prevent um, this occupation. So the offensive cyber attacks against and uh, on the Russia, on the territory of the Russian Federation are not allowed. Only attacks uh, at uh, Russian control systems and maybe cyber infrastructure that is. Uh, used for the coordination of uh, cyber attacks against the Ukraine. And uh, so there has to be made a differentiation. Uh, attacks can only be oriented against military uh, goals, not against general Russian infrastructure that is involved with civilian objects. So everybody that is in the, uh, would uh, be um, not complying with this um, differentiation law uh, because uh, that's where the fourth criteria is um, not really fulfilled, which is the, uh, the adhering to the laws uh, of war. So uh, now if 
none of these people can be categorized as combatants and none of the three co categories of combatants can be applied in this case. These uh, participants would be considered as civilians, so they uh, are civilians are just people that can't be categorized as combatants. So now we remember the slide with the civilians. The civilians generally um, can um, obtain the, the protection and uh, should not be the goal of uh, attacks. But that only is applicable as long as they don't are immediately participating in um, attacks against uh, uh, in, or any combat. So in, in that case, they can lose their civilian protections according to the Geneva Convention. But now, now we can consider what is an immediate uh, participation in um, enemy activities. So, uh, how can this be um, considered? So, there are also some things that need to be considered here. So, the International Committee of the Red Cross has uh, published this um, uh, thing here to properly differentiate um, these. Uh, there need to be uh, three things um, that have to be uh, apply applied. The, the they must act to be likely to adversely affect the military operations uh, of military capacity or party of an armed conflict or alternatively to inflict death, injury or destruction on persons or other objects protected against direct attack. And uh, there must be a direct causal link between the act and the harm likely to result either from that act or from a coordinated military operation of which that act constitute an integral part. So now I want to cite Hans-Peter Gaffer and Nils Micha. Um, they say that an uh, immediate involvement with the hostilities uh, of, with the enemy um, is um, only really uh, applicable if they take up arms themselves. And they also say that um, as long as uh, the behavior of a civilian person is um, in, in, in a large part um, involved with the war, it doesn't really matter if they personally um, are actively involving in uh, combat or just uh, maybe involved in intelligence. And so at least in this case, uh, people, hackers that um, are fulfilling these three um, constitutive elements, they can be um, considered and uh, maybe killed for their actions. But one also has to state, and that is where I want to uh, get to the finish here, um, this, uh, there is a very heterogeneous group involved with the Ukraine war. And uh, all of these different uh, levels of involvement have to be categorized very differently so that uh, at least some uh, Ukrainian hackers um, have to be considered to have um, combatant status. Others, maybe the, the expert army, uh, may be considered com combatants through the second category. And, the, um, and many others then uh, are considered civil civilians. And, but I also want to say that um, all of this can only be argued if uh, there is uh, proof for these individual um, involvements and there's also an investigation team in involved that is currently collecting um, evidence about uh, all of this involvement like many other states are doing as well. And uh, that's where I want to say thank you for your questions. and. Um, now I'm excited for your questions and uh, comments. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very informative uh, and uh, everybody that is involved, especially for them. Uh, currently, there are actually no questions at all. Um, maybe some people are a bit uh, overwhelmed. Oh dear. Yeah, well, 
It is a heady subject, international law, the Geneva Convention, the First Amendment Protocol. I can understand that. Yeah, and it has to be said, uh, one can be of the opinion that one is a combatant in the moment as soon as one is involved in any way. Exactly. But that there are different criteria for that. And maybe the levy en masse is only applicable if I am not actually in uh, unoccupied territory. So maybe if I'm in Donbass, um, uh, if I am secretly involved there, then uh, if, if behind like closed doors, then I am of course involved, but uh, according to the Geneva Convention, I am still illegally involved. Then you are not a combatant, not a levy, not part of a mass levy. This term illegal combatant is of course out in the open, uh, uh, illegitimate combatant. It has, for example, been used uh, in relation to the war in Afghanistan in 2001. And that is a very problematic category and uh, the category of an illegit illegitimate combatant because at least if we look at state actions, such as those of the US, uh, that means that people that are considered legal combatants are then not given any rights at all from any Geneva, Geneva Convention or the Hague Convention on War. And they are not uh, regarded or granted any human rights if they're not treated as combatants. Uh, so it has to be said that this is a very problematic category and uh, this is a category that not many people agree with, uh, both on the international level this is very much disputed and also on the uh, question of uh, uh, in, in politics. So um, those that uh, try to apply force on a legal basis, they're not illegal combatants, uh, they might be civilians. Uh, involved in hostilities, but they're not EU combatants, because that would have very far-reaching consequences. I mean, uh, if you remember in this area, there were a, a lot of German soldiers a while ago, and um, the people in the occupied territory, in the German occupied territory, um, were, um, that maybe there were people that uh, were um, active in combat and maybe sabotaged the Germans, they were uh, executed as uh, partisans. Yes, well, I don't know the subject very well, but I can imagine that the, this, this concept of, of a partisan, uh, that of course arose in the Second World War. And the Geneva Conventions in its amendment protocols, because of the experience of the two world wars, particularly the Second World War, they introduced this second combatant category in order to have partisans, irregular fighters, guerrillas, whatever, be included and assign them or grant them the combatant status. And if these German uh, people that are involved uh, are supposed to receive combatant status because they should be regarded as guerrillas or whatever, that means that they could always be killed legitimately because uh, the uh, armed parties involved, of course, they can uh, get involved in hostilities as well and are allowed to kill. So how do mercenaries have to be um, categorized here? Well, mercenaries and spies are separate categories in the Geneva Conventions. They are not given combatant, combatant status because they have been hired specifically. So in no case will they receive combatant status for, from international law. So who actually sticks to international law? Does this even, is this even relevant, relevant for Russia? That is a very interesting question. Very good one, of course. So what's the sense of it all? Why do we have to distinguish between combatants and civilians? Why do we have to distinguish between civilian objects and military objects? Well, we see in the Ukraine war, 
uh, we've very often seen that certain words were used, crimes of war, war crimes, crimes against humanity, um, ag aggression, war of aggression, and so on. So in order to verify whether a crime of war, a war crime has occurred, it is essential to, to find out whether combatants were attacked or civilian population were the objective, whether civilian objects were attacked. So all this uh, is part of the question whether a war crime has been committed or a crime against humanity and so on. So in that case, it is very relevant. And the other question, or the first question, who actually will keep or adhere to this law? Well, the question is, the humanitarian international law isn't a law that prevents or prohibits war. It is a law that uh, applies certain rules to a war regulates a war or maybe makes it slightly more humanitarian, but it doesn't prevent war, and which would be utopian anyway. You cannot imagine a world, a world order, at least the history has shown that we haven't found a world order that, that can get by without war. So what the humanitarian international law is trying is to subject to, to apply rules to law. For example, the combatant category, the civilian category, um, oh. Okay, so the can the the, the usual uh, habits of of war um, can they be applied to combatants in a cyber war? Yes, so that is an area where I am struggling myself. Uh, taking, for example, the second combatant category, the first category of the members of the armed forces is not very problematic. Uh, as soon as you have a cyber command, cyber unit, uh, things are clear. But the second combatant category and the third um, does require that uh, weapons are carried openly. And that, from it, the point of view of international law, well, it is kind of disputed. Uh, the Tallinn manual, for example, says the, the Tallinn manual says that uh, the uh, you cannot always be carrying your weapons openly. So the criteria criterion must sometimes be abolished because how do you prove this as well in cyberspace? So how can we in any way understand whether the weapons were carried openly? So that is a very problematic category, and a, another. A difficult issue that I want to point to, if arms are carried openly, the second category demands of the militias and volunteer corps that the members uh, should have a very clearly distinguishable sign that they carry so that they can be dis distinguished from the civil population. And that again leads to very practical problems. Because, as I said, how is, can, are you supposed to verify that in cyberspace? How can you prove these in cyberspace? So I'm not just going to discuss problems of international law, though. I'm also, I also want to point to um, a paragraph, Article 44, in the first protocol, the amendment protocol. And that article says that under certain conditions, these two criteria uh, to be distinguishable from a distance uh, and to carry arms openly, these two criteria or these two problem criteria I've, that I've just mentioned could be um, under certain conditions not fulfilled because there might be a situation, whether in cyberspace or in the physical world, uh, where it's often it's not really easily, but there are no unique rules to, to distinguish arms and, and, and these characteristics. So these could be um, sometimes not applied, but the international law has to be adhered to. The rules and um, the rules of international law must still apply, so you must not attack civilian objects and so on. So a very interesting point of view comes from this question. Uh, does it matter if um, 
the cyber war can be ca even categorized as a conventional war. So, can uh, the inter can can you actually consider territories to be occupied on the internet, for example? That is an interesting point, which leads to the question. What does cyberspace actually mean, or how can you define cyberspace? How can you define these international law concepts such as sovereignty in cyberspace? Cyber territory, cyber territory um, I would like, I, I think it's important to think about these questions. It's a, these are very legitimate questions, but I would also like to point to the whole term of cyber war and how problematic it is because war in international law means an armed conflict, a real armed conflict, either an international one between states or between non-international armed conflicts between states and non-state actors perhaps. And uh, the, criteria, the criterion of the war underlies certain rules. Not everything is an armed conflict. There has to be a certain threshold of violent actions that has to be over and that has to be surpassed. And this threshold isn't surpassed in the cyberspace at the moment. There hasn't been a cyber attack or a singularly cyber attack independent of conventional warfare that uh, led to any lethality of, of any to any fatalities so these are important questions but we haven't come to that point yet i think yeah we can't know that of course because we don't know if um, anyone um, maybe hacked uh, the icu of a hospital or something and yeah. uh, maybe killed people because of that and um, maybe some other scenarios as in nuclear uh, reactors and stuff like that um, maybe stuff like that already happened maybe it uh, will happen um, there are um, different um, people that have already um, talked about that yeah. a lot yeah. that might be also an interesting thing to talk about that in the breakout room later um, there are also two more questions open, but um, I want to thank you very much.